Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the 11 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And we're talking about community matters. We're talking about coronavirus. What's next? Um, so let's talk with uh, Winston Welch and uh, Stephanie Dalton uh, about what is happening with the disease, you guys. You did a little research. So Winston, we have new symptoms that have just popped up. What are they? Well, the CDC has advised three new symptoms. Uh, so it makes it look more like the, the common cold more than uh, anything else. So uh, in addition to the ones that we've already heard about, uh, we've got some other ones here and they are, uh, let's see. So you've got shortness of breath, fever, cough. We already heard about that. Uh, chills, shaking, loss of taste, muscle pain, headache, and sore throat. Uh, so I think those are the last ones. <clears throat> Are what they have added on there, which was sore throat. Uh, what did it say? Six, they added six more. I'm sorry, I just lost it here. Uh, oh, congestion, running nose, nausea, diarrhea joined the federal agencies list that already included fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss or taste of smell and sore throat. So it sounds like everything that everybody would ever go to the emergency room for. But um, uh, you know, the only Winston, one that's- We've heard that's, all that's of those strange. before. Every one of the ones uh, well, we had heard, but like have, the, have been discussed the, before. I didn't, I hadn't heard runny nose or congestion. So that one was a new one um, for me. And out of all of these, you know, the, uh, the loss of taste or smell is the only really distinguishing one from any other diseases that might present in a- But um, well, we've heard that before, it's not new. What I, you know, this reminds me of the CDC uh, ads, which have begun uh, appearing on television, where the CDC gets on, you know, buys a spot on television and, and the spot says, wash your hands. I said, my God, that, that is amazing that they're just getting around to tell us that Nat, now. Do you think that everybody in the country hasn't heard that X millions of times already? Why are they telling us now? At the same time, at the same time, this is my point, they haven't told us about that whole list you just read. Now, if they were really interested in informing us and saving us, they would give us the whole list, wouldn't they? I would think they would more focus on other strategies like uh, wearing a mask in public and uh, that this is not a controversial thing. Every credible health authority in the entire world. No, but masks well as, have been politicized. It says wear a mask. It's a simple- The White House is opposed strategy. to that. The White House does not want to encourage you. That the is White not a, the White House is not a credible health authority, but elements inside of the government do our credible health authorities like the National Institutes of Health or the CDC. They, they do say to wear a mask as well as our state, local governments, everybody understands that this Are, are you public. saying that the CDC is separate and distinct and not under the influence of, of Donald Trump and the White House? No, uh, sadly not, because when we're just seeing a, an ad come out after three months that says to wash your hands, it has, it is still its own organization. It has just been blocked at the top like so many other organizations, uh, well, uh, departments of the government have been. So we can find true news inside of it. Um, but we have to look for it. It's not coming out from the top. <laughs> well, well, okay, but um, why doesn't the uh, a coronavirus task force tell us about this, Stephanie? That has dissipated, that's gone away. That is no longer there. And uh, the, the, speak, the speaking by Fauci and uh, Red, uh, Dr. Redfield and Dr. Red Lenner, those are all coming out of their own uh, areas of employment and they're, they're silent on why they're not participating in the, in the task force, it's just over. But I know that with Red Lenner, who is a person who's the director of the National Center for Disease uh, Disaster Research and has, has uh, said that um, his, his prediction out of the work that they've done is that 50% of Americans will get this virus by the end of 2020, 50%, because the estimates are so low, the truer estimates are those that they have been broadcasting at 10%, he says it's higher. It says 10 times, uh, the, the news is saying 10 times 
the number that's reported uh, for um, for the the 2.5 million is actually going to be by more like 20. I think that came, I think that came out of the CDC, um, and it was this morning. And for everyone that's reported, they say there are 10 more. Um, yeah. So right. so, so uh, that's really that's just amazing. Two thousand. 20,000 for what's on the news. And then it's actually the estimate is half of us are going to get it because it's going vir vir so virulently. Now, the right. good news. Well, so far, only like 5% have gotten it, which is uh, or, or less, 2%, something really low. So we're um, all slammed and sneaking around to escape it. Now, the good news is that more young people are getting it, which means that cases are going to rise dramatically, but the deaths aren't. So it's still going to be the oldsters and at riskers who are going to die, but um, the the others are going to recover because the young people seem to be recovering. You have, to, you have to see the young people as um, more than just having having coronavirus. You have to see them as spreaders. They're unknowing spreaders, and uh, they can spread it to everyone else. So even if they do fairly well in dealing with the disease personally, they're going to be throwing viral particles in all directions without without knowing it. That's why it's so dangerous to have these rallies uh, and reopenings because they go and they feel just fine, but everybody around them is getting the particles. Well, the chilling, the chilling news for me is that they are saying the children are asymptomatic and may not be getting it as easily because their nose their nose tissues are not mature enough to provide the catch meant or the attachment feature of the of the corona it can't hang get in there and hang there and do its thing as well as it does in the adults so they have some degree of protection from what i've heard and read however they're saying that a kid can be a spreader so the kid can have the virus and be unsymptomatic and then and and unaffected much and yet can still take it around and spread it as you're saying these other post post infection young people can be okay let's talk some more medicine uh winston what about this bcg thing uh is that is that a viable option to to treat the virus i don't know it's it's interesting to see that that that's one theory as why folks in uh in korea and japan have not been been hit as hard is because they were vaccinated against that uh, uh whereas we in america were typically not um at the time. So it, it may be something, there may be something in there where the immune system is recognizing it um, even decades later. Um, I've seen other things where they're saying maybe some antibiotics will help or uh, even uh, using radiation um, on, on the lungs. But uh, it's interesting to see all of these other uh, things coming up and saying who doesn't get it and why and why are they uh, why are they not getting it and trying to focus on that but i don't think we have 250 500 million doses of uh, bcg vaccine uh, ready to go in this country either and even if they decided that was the the, the cure uh it'd take a long time for the, that to get rolled out as well so i don't know that there's any magic bullet here and as far as the young people we, we read about young people getting this and it's a third of the cases now uh from what i've read about a third are in their 20s but when we say they've recovered, I think it's important to realize that we don't know what recovery means. And a lot of people are not recovering or when they're recovering, they're recovering with lungs that are permanently damaged or organs that may be permanently damaged. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, we shouldn't be uh, cavalier at all about who gets this disease and why we can see that certain groups certainly are dying uh, a, a, at a lot higher rates, but you know, the, uh, so why isn't the CDC treatment. telling us that? Uh, they, I just don't think that they're they're in disarray right now. They're afraid to publish their results. They're afraid to. I mean, there's there's a, a culture of fear inside of so many agencies of the government that we may not be getting this information for a while. Um, and I, I think that if they if the CDC really wants to help us right now, it needs to have a mass campaign sent to every house that says wear a mask when you are outside it protects it's uh, it's a it's the right thing to do to protect you and other people yeah but like, the president doesn't wear a mask and uh, he's sending doesn't wear a, a message mask. to a lot yeah. of people 
and you have even like a, I saw there was a sheriff in Washington State. Jay Inslee says the governor wear masks when you're outside, and he, and the the sheriff says don't be sheep, people. Don't wear a mask if you don't want to wear a mask. You're getting very contradictory messages, and I think in places in the world they're just looking at us like what kind of mask delusion are we under here that we can't simply abide by wearing a mask? This is not a major um, ask. Yeah. Okay, let me tell you about a question that came in. Uh, this person, uh, and, and thank you to the viewer for the question. Um, uh, I work in hospice care. Uh, when the second wave hits, perhaps in the fall, it's coming soon, uh, will society deem as expendable those with severe dementia and allow the virus to reduce our medical care load? Whoa. This, that's out of a, a, a bad science fiction novel. Uh, Stephanie, you got a reaction to that? We care about old people who have dementia. How much do we care? How little do we care? I think we care. I've been through the hospice situation with my husband, but I, um, I believe that um, one uh, of the tools that the administration has to use and that has been admitted now in the, in the, the reporting uh, testifying to the to the House committee is that there's fear. There, people are afraid of the president. And so it has been um, assumed, I mean, I assumed it and even worried about mortal threat at some point, but people are indeed admitting that they're afraid of the president and that's why they, they did some of the things they did. So what I'm saying is that the fear of this is, is rational because if there is by omission or commission, a threat by the president, there may be some hold up on getting the right supplies and the and the important medicines to these healthcare facilities. But on the other hand, everybody's had a chance to ramp up. We know that's a weak spot. So we know we knew that early and that there's been a tremendous effort to strengthen the facilities and to get the supplies in. So um, it's it's it can go. Well, if you had a choice between going into a, a senior facility, you know, because you would otherwise go into a, a senior facility and saying, no, I think I'll stay at home instead right now. Which one would you pick? Uh, definitely stay at home. There just there were so many flaws in the in the systems of these nursing homes pre all of this that needed fixing them were actually. Okay, I want to go to this uh, this this uh, expectation, this projection that came out in the morning paper. I forget which one. It said next few months we're going to have one hundred and eighty thousand deaths. We're at one hundred and twenty now, so this is moving very quickly. And, uh, you know, I don't know the total number, but between the three or four top states where, you know, it's spiking, we're talking about 15, 20,000 per day. Um, so it's, it's quite remarkable what's happening. Um, so in the next couple of months, we'll be 180,000. But, the, but the, the think tank that came up also said that if we all wore masks, it would be 140,000. So we can save 40,000 lives if we all wear masks. I find that remarkable. And to your point, Winston, it's incredible that people don't all get that. That just seems so simple. The other thing is testing. You know, on, on Saturday night, uh, Trump said, I love this part, uh, Trump said at the rally in Tulsa that he was, uh, he, that he was gonna slow down on, 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 um, on testing. Because the more you test, the more, you, the more cases you find. And he didn't want to find the cases. He wanted to turn his back on the numbers, ignore them, so let's not do testing. And then when the press called him on that, he said, no, 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 I was just joking. Now, my reaction was, you could have fooled me that he was just joking because we all saw him say that, and he wasn't, he didn't seem to be joking. I think it was his press secretary said he was joking, and then yeah. he said, I never joke. Isn't that what it was? Uh, <laughs> Whatever it is, no, it's, well, yeah, it doesn't joke, it's just but a campaign lies, of you know? disinformation where he says one thing and says, oh, I was just doing it to razz the press or whatever it is. I mean, I, I, we can't. The best part, Winston, is that this morning he announced or the paper reported that he was he was defunding uh, the testing program. No more testing, no more support for testing in these in the, in this country from the federal government. I said, well, I guess I guess now he's not not lying. Now he's not joking, he's really doing it. 
because she doesn't want to know about the cases. Well, that, but you know, this is part of the strategy of having the states and local governments take care of it. So if your state is one that takes it seriously, uh, that's great. But you know, there's others, even inside of the states, you've got uh, other elements like in, uh, I saw Governor Newsom says, you're wearing a mask if you're in public. And then he, he is having to threaten to cut off counties that don't abide by the law that are going rogue and saying, oh no, this is a matter of personal freedom or or whatever. Um, it's 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 a matter of public health. Same for Arizona. I saw that the this governor is had funding. This is funding. Allow the decision yes. to be made at the state or local level. But but up till now, a lot of them, a lot of states and lo localities that have tested people have been have had the benefit of federal funds to pay for the costs of the tests. Now well, that's being that. that's being removed. Yeah, that's done. But you, you have to think about it. This is a this has become a political thing. So when the president says, "If you're wearing a mask, it's you are stating that you are against me," and so uh, I mean it's dangerous on a number of levels. But basically, just so you're wearing a mask and you're let's say you're in a a, a state where you have people that really believe that that's true and there is no threat of the virus or there or, or whatever they believe and you're wearing a mask and you might be surrounded by a hostile crowd of non-mask wearers that are thinking that you're making a political statement by wearing a mask when in fact you're just trying to follow basic hygiene of public health and so this it, it's so convoluted it's it's you can't understand well, it's, the it's cognitive not, well there is, there is a common denominator he's he's uh, trump is doing all this he's managing things like a marionette marionette a puppeteer. Uh, and I, I give Stephanie these two things and see if you can connect them up. One is that there was a curfew established by the city of Tulsa over the weekend, because they were very worried about a lot of things about COVID among other things, and they were you know, concerned about demonstrations and violence and all. Um, so they were taking all the steps they could and they made a curfew. Well, <clears throat> the Secret Service went to the city and instructed them to take the curfew off. Secret Service works for who? Uh, okay, and, and they did. So then the curfew went away. In a parallel fashion, um, you know, the United States Attorney for the District of Hawaii is involved in litigation over the, mm, the travel quarantine that David Ige imposed, which is about to be changed already. Um, but, they, but what happened is the Department of Justice went to the U.S. attorney for the District of Hawaii and told him uh, to make sure to oppose that travel, that travel quarantine requirement. So they leave it to the states. The states try. Um, and now the White House is trying to insinuate itself into the decisions the states make. I mean, what do you see a comparison there? And do you see other things happening like that where uh, the president says, oh, no, I'm leaving it to the states. And if anything goes wrong, it's their fault, not mine. Um, and then what we have is you try to manipulate through other agencies. Well, the states, according to the latest news, are at breaking points. Most of them, all of them. They have no more funding. OK, it's all dried up. And they're having to depend on the sources that they get from the federal government. So I see this, uh, it could be a, de de a desperate blow for states who are already underwater. And uh, without money for the funding for, for tests in states, states are not going to be able to pick that up to supplant what the, the feds are no longer going to give. So that, of course, is going to have a huge impact. And uh, the, um, the, the, this seems to be the pattern that I'm seeing and in, uh, because states are not going to be able to afford to do all of these. Where are they getting the money from? That they, they've got to get the money from their state taxes and they're not going to have that coming in. People are not able to pay and they're prolonging it. Well, this, this goes to the whole reopening issue. So uh, they have the, uh, the PPP, the uh, Payroll Protection Program. Um, which is part of the CARES Act, right? It is billions and billions of dollars involved. The deadline for filing, okay, is uh, uh, June 30th. That's one week away. You'd really have to hustle uh, to make your application, to get the loan, 
uh, to take the remaining part of that money and, and, and get the benefits of the PPP. Congress has not authorized any more money. Um, it has largely ex expired. There's 120 some odd billion left that has not been spent. Don't ask me why that would be true. Um, and we are about to have what the paper charitably calls a pause, a pause in many states. So first you have the epidemic, which you don't recognize, then you recognize it, and then you have a lockdown, and then you have a reopening, and then you have a re-epidemic, a spike, all these are great words to describe the, the journey we've been on. And after the spike or the resurgence, now we're having a pause in three or four states today. Um, so where does it take us when you have the pause on the reopening and these businesses don't really have options uh, to get the federal money or more federal money? And they are going, lots of them are gonna go out of business, Winston. What is gonna to happen to our economy in the pause? I, I don't see any pause in anything, honestly. It seems like these numbers are just climbing, climbing, climbing in you know, California, Florida. This is the pause just, in reopening. It's the pause uh, in reopening. I, I don't, you know what? It, it's like I've said a month ago, we're just giving up on it. We're just gonna let it run wildfire and do what it does. And that question from the viewer was <clears throat> deeply disturbing, not, and thank you for the question, it, this idea of sort of a eugenics almost um, of, of letting our weakest and sickest die. That is the hallmark of civilization is that we take care of our weakest and sickest. So I would hope that, um, although who was the, the fellow that initially on said, uh, was it Glenn Beck or somebody said, I would gladly go out and sacrifice for you know, my life for the economy or whatever it was a couple months ago. But when it actually comes down to real people and letting them do that, it's, it's horrific to even think that we would um, be a society that does that. We're not in the, we're not in the a place where we need to make those choices. This is, but what we do need is just common sense solutions. Here in Hawaii, we, when we open up here, which we are opening up, I was down at the beach the other day, the the we're beach, also having a spike if you look at the charts. And we are having a spike every the, day. Packed and restaurants are packed. I, I, I'm seeing it. Uh, well, businesses are, are have picked up. Definitely, people are out and about. When we start getting our tourists back in here, we need common sense rules that that require several days, several tests, two or three tests minimum, and then a couple of days after that, where we can always reach them by phone just in case they slip through the test and using different tests. We can do it, we can do it sensibly. Um, we were down to zero zero new cases for a while there, and now we're just you know back up to 18, 19, 15, 12 cases a day, and that's gonna go way up as well once mm -hmm. we open the doors here. We are opening them, and uh, we, we're not on a pause here yet. And um, you know we're trying to get more people to come, um, and uh, the restaurants are open and full. And uh, I think in, in, in all that message of reopening, there's a certain sub message about, um, you know, complacency. You don't have to worry, it's over. We're beyond that, we have prevailed, we're back. And all this is coming originally from, from Trump. So Stephanie, are you going out to a lot of restaurants these days? I mean, personally, don't you have some concern about that? Well, certainly I do, I mean, but I have the more general concern about Hawaii's economy and its survival and the nation's because the economists are predicting it's at least three to five years for, for recovery from this fiscal calamity. And uh, certainly in Hawaii, the prediction is that or longer. And it's going to require a leadership governance to have multi-year strategies for spending cuts. So because they're not going to have the inflow of uh, income that that states and cities and counties um, uh, expect to have. So I think we're facing that. And I understand the tension is terrific because when you go to that restaurant, I have a good feeling when I do get whatever I get, usually takeout. Um, I'm happy, you know, to tip and all of that because these people are in survival mode and it is in, we are all connected in it together. So they do need as much support as possible. And of course, many are dropping by the wayside. And this is putting the state and us all in this disastrous on the edge 
of the cliff of real financial calamity, where we don't have the funds to do the things we know need to be done. I mean, of course, the biggest one is like 911. Who's going to pay for that? What about the police? Who's going to pay for that? What about the schools? I mean, all of this stuff is real close to home here when it comes to the list of what are the funding needs. And with the state having no money, they're going to start down that list. And that's leading us right mm -hmm. to civil chaos. Yeah. Watch out for that. We have a $2.3 billion shortfall in the state budget. The uh, legislature was really out for most of the session. It's back now. Um, and the question is, what do we do to cover that $2.3 billion? Well, one of the things they have done, uh, I think a few days ago, is they agreed over objection by some members of the community to give $150 million uh, to the unions for um, a delayed increase in pay. Uh, to union members, uh, to, uh, I think HGA, uh, the uh, Hawaii Government Employees Union, um, which, which you can see is political and which you can see drives the other direction about trying to, you know, mm, narrow the gap and uh, avoid the shortfall. So we're not sure what they're going to do in the next couple of weeks, but it's a monumental task to deal with the shortfall as you say, Stephanie, that where we don't have the, the tax revenues that we used to have before. And every time you look, the Council on Revenues, you know, doesn't find any improvement in that. In fact, we find a deterioration in that. So Hawaii has a, a serious and unique problem. And I don't, I don't know when we'll have a vaccine or a therapeutic or anything. Um, we, well, before we started the show, you guys were talking about this O, blood type O, uh, transfusion. Um, what, what about that? Does that offer any, any comfort here? It seems there's some, there's some evidence that the different blood types are having infection at different levels and that the O's looking like not much infection. Those with O's are not as often infected. So my, I, I, I haven't seen any more about that, but it looks like there's a line of research opened up here and that might give us the option of, uh, the, you know, transfusions, you know, if the O types are, I, I don't even know if that's an effective way to get the effects out of the O into another person. So, I mean, with the antibody research and this kind of blood, uh, which might tie in with what Winston was talking about earlier with the vascular disease connection. I mean, maybe we're getting, some, we're getting a good, rich, strong effort on the research to, to uncover some of it. Indeed the we are, and the press is covering it, and I, I get more confused every day about w what the good candidates are, because you know they're not all good candidates. And, and there's talk about herd immunity, such as uh, I think in Sweden, where they made a policy choice on that. Herd immunity means what, 60%, uh, 70% of the population has had it. Um, and so the, the, the fertility rate, so to speak, the transmission rate is reduced below one per capita. And then it sort of dies out because there's nobody around to spread it. Um, this is a long shot. And it also means that 60 or 70% of the people have had it and um, are at risk of really being seriously ill and dying. Uh, it's not very attractive, but you know what? We may go through that anyway. Winston, you know, if we don't have a solution and if the federal government is not going to help us and everybody's confused and they think it's a question of their personal liberty and to wear masks and, and get tested and all this, and we're in a state of chaos on this issue, chaos, um, then what will happen is we will have herd immunity, but a lot of people will die in the process. Am I right? Tell me I'm wrong. Well, like you said, lots of information, lots of confusion out there, 160 different vaccine tests going on right now on people. Who knows who's gonna to rise to the top? What, basically at this point, what is under your control? Under your control, you can't control Donald Trump, you can't control the governor. What you can control is wearing a mask when, when you go out. If you are at risk, you reduce your going out. If you are, Everyone is at risk, but if you are at higher risk, you reduce that. When you go out, you make sure that you are practicing good uh, social distancing and common courtesy because we are not sociopaths and we respect each other with aloha. And that is what we can do as individuals. We can keep abreast of things, but eventually whenever vaccines or treatments come out, that will happen. But in the meantime, we have the, the control we have is wash your hands, cover your face, 
Yeah, yeah we've heard that. Kindly. We've heard that. But, you know, the problem is complacency sets in. So if I tell you there's going to be, what did Fauci say the other day? Don't expect any vaccine until at the earliest, the end of 2021. Okay? Yes. So yes. that's a year, and, a year and a half away already. Well, yeah, about a year and so, a half away. Yeah, we may get corona fatigue. Very true. And exactly. We may, and then we have complacency we, setting in. And because you wash your hands yesterday doesn't help you today. Because you wore a Mac yesterday doesn't help you today. And people will kind of slough off on that sort of thing. And then we'll be back in my my favorite scenario, namely herd immunity, because you know we're not taking care of ourselves. The I, I individual think should... benefit is that you won't catch it today. That doesn't yes. solve the problem on the community level. Today, yes, that's a good point, is it's today, and that's all you got is today anyway. But uh, we should avoid the idea of herd immunity because we don't know that there's any herd immunity. This could be closer to smallpox or HIV as far as its transmissibility and protection and maybe even a, a, a vaccine out there. So it may be just that Sweden took their pain a little bit earlier, but they also had public health and hospital beds. And that's what we were really trying to avoid was the, uh, the, the surge or the hump. And now we... We have gotten past that, and we realize, okay, we can. Our hospitals can handle it, so we're have just we, spreading we, out now. We're in a we're in a spike right now. The other oh, day, as you were pointing out, we had twenty seven cases. Well, yes, we it's going to continue for a year, but they decided our hospitals can handle it at this point because we avoided the initial surge, and they looked at Sweden and said, okay, they had so many ICU beds, and yeah, their death rate was four times higher, but they could handle it. So I think they just are extrapolating and putting it here. Stephanie, you really want to say something, don't you? Italy, Spain, Germany are down, okay? They had the self-discipline that we started out to have and fell apart from it. So that discipline has those European countries under control and they are locking us out, us Americans out. We right. Americans who are going to be their threat. Okay, now they did it. We can do that. We just have to pick it up and do it. There's no doubt we can do it, and we just have to step up to it. We missed our first opportunity and paid for it. Now let's go again. Pick it up and get it get it knocked under. That's exactly what we got. I do. think the, the horse left the barn. We can do it in Hawaii and Alaska, and that's about it at this point. Hawaii. There's no doubt we can do it in Hawaii because there's a disciplined population here that. Uh, can, can manage. So, so Stephanie, you mentioned a number of countries in Europe, but what about Asia? Um, there's been a bit of a resurgence in Korea, a bigger resurgence in Beijing. Uh, Beijing is now under a, a brand new lockdown um, and other places, uh, even Singapore has, has spikes. So question is, what can we learn from Asia? A lot from them because they know how to do this. They did the same thing as Germany and, and Spain. Those people followed that. But the point is because they do the contact and the follow-up and the continued testing, they're still, they didn't, they're doing follow-up. They have the continued care continuity of attention to this. So that as soon as they find the spot that's going to come back up, they get them and they isolate them and they treat them and that's it. So they're not going to rise up again to a plateaued uh, kind of graph like we have. They're going to one, one more thing is okay. So we we, we test, and um, maybe we're getting better at testing. We appreciate that testing is only good for a moment in time. Twenty four hours later, you know, you could have the virus. Um, but let's assume we find somebody on our testing program uh, who has who has the who has the disease. Um, what do we do about that? What do we do about that here? Uh, we don't. We don't have a working tracing program. We don't have that. We don't have a, you know rooms full of people who make telephone calls and trace through. We don't have software that does it. So we find somebody. What do we do? We warn the person. What do we do? with that is they do not let the person go as soon as the person is identified and not even yet tested they test them they don't go anywhere until that test result comes back then if that comes back positive they get shipped off to the wherever where the <laughs> warehouse of the wherever well I, mean, I suppose if you quarantine them that would even be better for the community they don't, uh, they don't. what do you what do you do what do you do Winston if you find somebody at, at tests positive what do you do you know what you you treat you treat them with kindness and aloha and assume you, we have 30,000 empty hotel rooms right a mile away from all of us in Waikiki we just designate that as a COVID hotel for right now 
we let them wait it out. We have medical care that's available to them if they need it and, and need to be elevated to a higher level of, of care. And we put everybody else that they came into contact with there until they prove that they, are, um, that they aren't carriers of the disease. We can do it in Hawaii. Stephanie's right. We can do it in Hawaii. And Weston and Hilton can just kick in on this and get temp pseudo hospital sections or temporary hospital sections. That's a wonderful contribution they are welcome to make. So we <laughs> and get paid for it. I mean, they need the revenue now too. Uh, so. Sure, they need somebody to be in their rooms. I mean, yeah, and we'll pay them assuming we have the money. Assuming we have the money. Generous. Okay, you guys, we're about out of time. I hate I hate being out of time. <laughs> on every level. Uh, so Winston, thank you very much for joining us. Winston Welsh, this is Coronaville, uh, what's next? And, and Stephanie Dalton, thank you so much. We'll thank talk to you, you soon and in any event next week, aloha.